Daisy and I'm the supervisor of occupational therapy at Future Insight. We're based out of Concord, New Hampshire, but we service the entire state of New Hampshire and we work with all individuals with any degree of vision loss. The problem with some of these is that they're not very easy to read, particularly if you're pouring a clear liquid in mm -hmm. here. This is really difficult to read the markings on I this. can't see that at all. It's pretty terrible. There's a lot of aspects of vision that are affected by macular degeneration. A lot of people just think that vision impairment means that somebody has reduced visual acuity, but macular degeneration affects more than that. Macular degeneration affects a person's central vision, so the information is just not there, and that's because of the damage to the retina. Now because our central vision is also responsible for our color vision, People who have AMD also really struggle with color discrimination and may not be able to even see color at all. In more advanced cases, people may have a very difficult time with contrast or with dark adaptation. Yep, that's very the, small. The quantity indicated is very small. Now somebody who's a very confident chef may recognize that the smallest one is a quarter, a third, etc. But for people who like a little more peace of mind, might I recommend these? <laughs> Very easy. So taken collectively, all of these changes to a person's vision mean that we need to think about the three Bs when we're modifying someone's kitchen. And those are bigger, bolder, and brighter. And those are some good first steps to making a person's kitchen more accessible. So these are much bolder and mm -hmm. are just a lot easier to read mm -hmm. for somebody with vision loss. As you might imagine, there's a lot of aspects of kitchens and cooking that impact safety, and accessibility is something really important that we need to be thinking about. But every person's unique. So if you've met one person with AMD, that's just it. You've met one person with AMD. In addition, every kitchen is different, and all the appliances are different as well. So for one person, they may have a lot of concerns and worry about using their oven. They may worry that they're gonna overcook their food, that they're gonna start a kitchen fire, or maybe they're worried that they're not gonna be able to cook the food well enough and they're gonna serve some undercooked chicken. Another person may not have any worries about using their oven, but may really worry about using their knives and their fingers may be the proof of that. They may have a bunch of cuts on their fingers. This is a cut resistant glove. Yeah. So it comes in different sizes and then the person holds the product in their hand, and then if they accidentally touch their finger, their gloved finger, there's no risk of them being cut. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut that nice little truffle. So we really need to take the time to learn what the concerns are of the individual and address those specifically. But if I were to generalize, I would say that knife and food prep, that's a big concern of, for safety. Uh, ovens and stovetop burners, of course, and as well as moving the food in and out of the oven, as well as on top of the cooktop, are areas where we'll commonly address for safety. In addition, as I mentioned before, serving undercooked food is really a problem for a whole lot of other reasons. The good news is that all of these areas that present safety and accessibility concerns can all be addressed. So whether we're teaching people different tips and tricks to cut their food more safely, modifying ovens, or using protective equipment so that the person doesn't sustain any burns, we can address all of these. When we begin working with a client, we do a complete assessment, and that assessment usually takes about an hour. And we're gonna ask about all aspects of the person's life and functioning. Questions such as medication management, dressing, personal care, financial management. So cooking and being safe in the kitchen is just part of what we work on. 
As part of this assessment though, I'm going to get an idea for the things that this person wants to do and the ways that I can help them out. So it's a very client-centered approach to what we do as opposed to just going in the kitchen and making a bunch of changes. Are any of the labels difficult for you to read? Sure. Yeah, that's a common complaint that I hear from a lot of my clients. So we're going to talk about some different accessible labeling options. Ground mustard. McCormick Gourmet Pepper, ground white 1.75 ounces. So there are a lot of different measurements that I'll take. Um, one of those important measurements are measurements of light. So individuals with macular degeneration generally need more light as well as light that's in a particular part of the spectrum. So they need that cooler white light. So I'll use my smartphone as an improvised light meter and take some measurements throughout the kitchen. But in terms of measuring if someone's kitchen is overall accessible or safe for them, it's really a personalized approach. And one of the best tools that I have at my disposal for understanding how a person can operate in their kitchen are my ears. So I'm really gonna to listen to what their concerns are and what they need help with in the kitchen. Now, as I look at your display, I can see that there are pretty good numbers. They're high contrast and they're large, but a lot of microwaves are not so nice. They may have black numbers on a silver display and it makes it very difficult to read. In addition to taking some measurements, I do have a series of questions that I like to ask people. Now, if I just say, so how are you doing cooking in the kitchen? A typical answer might be, well, I'm doing fine. I don't have any problems. So I need to take a more nuanced approach. So I'll usually dig down a little deeper and say, tell me about your microwave. Are you having any difficulty operating it? And when I ask the question like that, I'll often get a very different response. People will often say, well, I have to lean in really close and I use this bright flashlight and then I'm able to see the numbers. When I hear a response like that, I know that there's usually a couple different areas where I can help out because people are probably working unnecessarily hard to do what they need to do. And I can probably make things a little easier. Cooking plays a role in so many aspects of a person's life. Obviously we want a person to be able to continue to cook so that they don't go without a meal. But secondarily, a person being able to maintain their cooking skills means that they're probably going to manage their health much better because they're not relying on prepackaged foods or frozen foods. Additionally, cooking plays such an important role in a person's sense of self, as well as a person's ability to maintain their valued social roles. Consider for a moment somebody who spent decades priding themselves in preparing the Thanksgiving meal for their family. Now imagine that person can no longer do that because of macular degeneration. They're not just losing out on a meal, they're giving up a social role. I'll talk through some of the difficulties that my clients have and maybe you'll find some of those solutions helpful. So what I'm holding in my hand are some bump dots as we call them. Mm -hmm. They're different stick on um, tactile marks so you can feel where an appliance has a button that you need to push. So what I could recommend for you is putting a bump right above the bake button mm -hmm. and we'll put another bump right below the enter. I think that's very helpful. Multitasking has been shown to be difficult for all individuals. The studies bear that out. And certainly as we age, it gets really difficult. Now, preparation is really the key here. So I like to encourage my clients to do the preparation before they start cooking. Trying to mince the garlic while you're sauteing your onions and you're trying not to burn them because you've stopped stirring is a surefire way to ruin a good meal. So taking the time to do your food prep ahead of time pays huge dividends. So for people with macular degeneration, it's not only the finding and identifying the ingredients that can be difficult, but measuring them out can take some additional time. So you wanna make sure in your cooking practices to account for that additional time and get organized. One of the techniques that I like to use is using a lot of small dishes or ramekins, but for individuals who may not have those at hand, 
Some saucers that you have lying around in your cupboard will do the job just fine. So when two people live together and are trying to cook in the same kitchen and it's modified for one person with vision loss, usually the modifications are pretty transparent to the person who doesn't have sight loss. Now that being said, one of the areas that can sometimes pose a problem is with lighting. Individuals with macular degeneration generally need a lot more light and also a different wavelength of light in order to be able to see well enough to complete cooking tasks. So in some homes where there's no Wi-Fi accessibility or smart home capability, that may mean that the person needs to use additional task lighting, or sometimes we need to swap out overhead light bulbs. This may work great for the person with macular degeneration, but maybe not so for the other person. In this case, sometimes the person who does the most cooking gets to choose which lighting configuration to go with. However, in homes that have smart home capability, we can really implement some unique innovations which allow for flexibility for both persons. Simply replacing the overhead light bulbs with Wi-Fi enabled tunable white bulbs means that the person can control the color and the brightness of the light with simply their voice. This means that when the person with macular degeneration is cooking, they can set the light bulbs to full bright and set them to a much cooler color. Now that cooler color may be a little off-putting to somebody who wants that soft, warm ambiance. So when that person's done cooking, the other person can simply change the color and the brightness of the light back, all with the use of their voice. Perfect when you're cooking in the kitchen because you don't have to get your hands, your dirty hands on anything. So technology can be intimidating for all of us, but what's really amazing is that most older adults these days have some form of technology, whether it's a smartphone or a smart home device. Now, if I'm working with a client with no smartphone and no Wi-Fi, we're probably gonna adopt a low-tech solution to whatever their problems are in the kitchen. However, a lot of my clients already are using a smartphone, and many of them have figured out that they can use their Google Assistant or Siri to make calls for them. In that case, I can really build upon those existing skills and use that as scaffolding to teach them new skills. So for example, they can say, Siri, set a timer for 15 minutes, or they can ask Alexa to set an oven timer for 30 minutes. They can find out conversions between different types of herbs and spices, whether they have the dry or fresh versions, and they can also use it to give them some recipes by audio means instead of having to rely on their vision to read a recipe. So it's really on a case-by-case -case basis that we use technology, but these days technology among the older adult population is more common than most people think. Which is easier for you to see? Either one. Microwaves can be notoriously difficult for people with low vision. A lot of times there'll be black numbers on a silver or gray background, making it really difficult to read the numbers. Additionally, a lot of microwaves are pushed back far on a countertop, and there's really not enough lighting for people to see adequately. The good news is we can usually fix these pretty quickly. We use a bunch of stickers that are tactile, meaning they're raised up and we can work with the client to figure out what are the buttons that they most need to push so that they can identify those buttons through their sense of touch. A good example is that most microwaves have a 30 second or a one minute button. Simply marking that one button so that the person can find mm -hmm. it can really make their microwave simple to use again. When it comes to stovetops, one of the biggest complaints that I hear is that it's difficult for clients to know which knob controls which burner. So we'll work with the clients to mark those so that they understand which knob is gonna heat up the right burner. Now, sometimes clients will say that they only use the front burners, but they're worried about turning the back burners on accidentally. A really quick fix for that is that we can often just remove the back burner knobs and then they don't have to worry. Modifying ovens is probably the most complicated. Modern ovens have gotten really fancy and a lot of the newer ones have glass touch sensitive displays. We can still modify these with tactile overlays, but sometimes we have to use other materials such as plastic to block off the parts of the touch screen that we wanna make sure that the client doesn't accidentally activate. 
There's nothing worse than trying to press bake and accidentally putting your oven into self-cleaning mode, which can be very difficult to get out of. This particular cutting board has two sides, a light side and a dark side. So for clients who have concerns about knife safety or accidentally cutting themselves because of their low vision, there are a number of things that we can do. At the low end of the spectrum, all the client may need is a high contrast double-sided cutting board. Now in this case, this doesn't create a lot of contrast with your countertop, but certainly with the onion now, I have a lot more contrast with my cutting surface. Whereas if they're cutting something dark like eggplant, they can use the lighter side of the cutting board. Unfortunately, some people have a really difficult time changing the way they do things, and it's because they're grieving the loss of their vision. So if they haven't moved on beyond the initial stages of grief, any changes to how they do something is really an acknowledgement of the fact that they're unlikely to get their vision back. So sometimes we can't really work with an individual and implement too many changes until they've moved on beyond those initial stages of grief. And as an occupational therapist or a low vision therapist who works with clients with macular degeneration, we really have to be mindful of that when working with our clients. Sometimes no matter how beneficial a modification is, the client's not willing to adopt it. In that case, we have to respect the client's wishes. Oftentimes though, a client will call us back a few months or maybe even a year later, and they're ready for those changes, and then we're happy to help them. Mm -hmm.